Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to cover chapter 14 of General Chemistry 2. This chapter is all about acid-base equilibria. Now, the behavior of acids and bases can effectively be described using the chemical equilibrium model we discussed last chapter. So, in this chapter, what we're going to do is remind ourselves of the definition of acids and bases that we formulated in General Chemistry 1. And then we're going to talk about how we want to use a different definition of acid base. This is going to be the bronsted lorry definition. We're going to focus on that this chapter. And it's because that this definition is much more broader and is applicable to both aqueous and non-aqueous systems. With that in mind, we're also going to uh, look at the auto ionization of water. We're going to see how the acidity of aqueous solutions can be described using the pH scale. We're going to also explore behaviors of strong acids and bases as well as weak acids and bases. And then use, uh, uh, we will discover the salts that can also behave as weak acids and bases and then describe the acid base properties of salt solutions before we end the chapter by talking about the rel relative strengths of acids and bases. Um, so with that in mind, those are the main topics we're going to uh, attempt to talk about this chapter. Let's get started. Let's start by reminding ourselves of the, de the previous definitions we had of acids, bases, and general chemistry one. In general chemistry one, we were introduced to the simplest definition of acids and bases. If you remember, we called this the Arrhenius definition. An Arrhenius acid is a substance that's going to produce hydrogen plus ions in aqueous solutions. So as an example, when we were discussing this, we looked at hydrochloric acid. That serves as a good example if you start off with hydrochloric acid. All right. This can dissociate into your H plus ions and your Cl minus ions, all right? The H, this hydrogen chloride was referred to as an Arrhenius acid because it produces these H plus ions in aqueous solution. On the contrary, Arrhenius base is a substance that produces hydroxide ions in aqueous solution. So a good example is looking at sodium hydroxide. This can dissociate into sodium plus as well as hydroxide ions. All right. Because it dissociates at, into hydroxide ions in solution, in aqueous solution, right? We can say that sodium hydroxide is an aqueous base. All right. In addition, using this Arrhenius definition, we talked about how an acid can react with a base in a neutralization reaction to form salt and water. Now, this, this simple approach to acids and bases, the problem with it, right? The problem with it is that it is limited to aqueous solutions. So, can we propose a new definition that's more broader and applicable? And the answer to that is yes. And that is the reason why we're going to introduce in this chapter the bronsted lorry description of acid-base behavior. In this definition, all right, in this definition, a bronsted lorry acid is a proton donor and a bronsted lorry base is a proton acceptor all right so an acid base reaction is going to involve the transfer of a proton from an acid to a base all right a good example to look at is this um uh this reaction here all right a a acid base reaction between hf hydrogen fluoride all right hydrofluoric acid and water all right Notice that this hydrofluoric acid is going to donate a hydrogen to the water, all right? And therefore, it's a bronsted lorry acid, all right? The water here is going to accept the proton, all right, acting as a bronsted lorry base, all right? Now, this is a reversible reaction. The fluoride anion on the right side here all right, can alternatively accept the proton from the hydronium ion H3O plus to form HF, hydrofluoric acid, and water again, so it's reversible. All right, what this means is that this fluoride ion, all right, anion, is a 
bronstant lori base and this hydronium ion can be a bronstant lori acid if we are going in the right reverse direction all right now since hydrofluoric acid acts as an acid on one side of the equi equilibrium arrow and um fluoride anion this f minus acts as a base on the other side what we can call this hydrogen fluoride uh, hydrofluoric acid and fluoride anion uh, we can refer to these as conjugate acid base pair all right what this means is all right this hydrofluoric acid acts as an as an acid to donate this hydrogen to the water all right what it results in, in, in as a product is this fluoride anion in the reverse direction, this fluoride anion can act like a base. So what we have here is this conjugate acid-base pair. All right, similarly, if we're looking at the water-hydronium pair, we're going to highlight those in green. If we're looking at the water-hydronium pair, all right, these can also act as a conjugate acid pair where the water accepts a proton on one side, all right, and the hydronium donates a proton on the other side. All right, pretty much any bronstant acid base is going to differ from its conjugate base by this one proton. All right, so what we can think about here is this H, H2O, H3O as an acid, a conjugate acid base pair where the hydrofluoric acid fluoride ion as another acid base uh, conjugate acid base pair all right fantastic all right so keep that in mind keep that in mind what we're going to do is use this as motivation for the rest of the discussion when we talk about strong acids and bases as well as weak acids and weak bases all right this is the definition that we will be referring to when we discuss acids bases now all right fantastic now there's one more definition that's important to keep in mind here all right and that's amphiprotic substances some substances like water can both donate and accept protons all right so water can act as a acid it can act as a base solvents that can both donate and accept pro protons are going to be described as amphiprotic. I'm going to spell that out here for us. All right, amphiprotic. And water is a great example of amphiprotic uh, uh, solvent uh, as amphiprotic solvents because they can both donate and accept protons. All right. With that in mind, we want to move on to the next section of this chapter, which is discussing the auto-ionization of water and also introducing the pH scale. All right. So we've just seen that water can act both as a bronstant lori acid and as a bronstant lori base. It can both donate and accept protons. Now, it's easy to imagine a process in which one, mo one water molecule donates a proton to another. In fact, this actually occurs in aqueous solutions in a process called auto-ionization, or you might hear it also as self-ionization. All right, so what's occurring here is you have one water molecule that's going to donate all right, is going to donate a hydrogen to another water molecule that's going to accept that hydrogen or that proton. All right, so you have one water that serves as an acid and one water that serves as a base. Now, like the vast majority of proton transfer reactions, this reaction is, dis is best described as an equilibrium. All right, so what, it, what, what that means is this reaction has its own equilibrium constant. What we're going to call this equilibrium constant is KW, or the ion product constant for water. All right, so if we are trying to write the equilibrium, um, equilibrium uh, reaction uh, formula for this, all right, if you remember, any equilibrium constant we dis define as product concentrations over reactant concentrations all right 
So if we're attempting to write this, what we might write are our product concentrations, so our hydronium, all right, H3O plus, as well as our hydroxide, OH minus, over, all right, H2O, and we have two of these squared. Now, you might get excited and just stop there, but if you remember, all right, when we're writing our equilibrium constant, we only include aqueous uh, uh, solvents. We ignore any liquids or solids. So actually, when we're writing our equilibrium constant here, all right, we don't write these waters in the denominator because they're in liquid form. What that means is that the equilibrium constant here associated with the auto ionization of water kw is only the concentration of the hydronium and the hydroxide and what this is equal to is 1 times 10 to the minus 14 at 25 degrees celsius all right now this is a very important relationship it tells us that all aqueous solutions contain some hydronium ions and some hydroxide ions and it allows us to determine the relative amounts of each now, in all aqueous solutions at 25 degrees Celsius, the concentration of hydronium times the concentration of hydroxide is equal to this value right here. This is true for any aqueous solution at 25 degrees Celsius. Now, aqueous solutions, they can be described as acidic, basic, or neutral, depending on the relative amounts of hydronium and hydroxide ions. So, a solution that maybe contains more hydronium than hydroxide, we can refer to the solution as being acidic. All right. In the case that the hydronium ions are less than the hydroxide, then we can refer to this as a solution as a basic solution. And when these amounts are equal to each other, then the solution is neutral. All right. Fantastic. Now, since a neutral solution is going to contain equal amounts of hydronium and hydroxide ions, what we can do is use the KW equation to determine the concentrations of hydronium and hydroxide. All right. What we can do is we can set up a relationship where we say, all right, our hydronium ions are going to be equal to our hydroxide ions they're going to equal some x value for a neutral solution, of course. All right, we're considering neutral where they're both equal in concentration. Well, then in that case, knowing that when we uh, our, our, our concentration of hydronium and hydroxide together is going to be 1 times 10 to the minus 14, all right, whenever we relate, when we equate hydronium and hydroxide, all right, and we see that they equal and they're going to be the concentrations of both are going to be equal for our neutral solutions then x all right squared all right is obviously going to be this 1 times 10 to the minus 14 all right and then we can go ahead and solve for x all right by taking the square root of both sides and x is then equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 7 molar what that means is in a neutral solution, our hydronium concentration is 1 times 10 to the minus 7, and our hydroxide solution is also 1 times 10 to the minus 7. And that's why when we're looking at our equilibrium constant with both of them, all right, multiplied together, that makes sense. They are both equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 14. Now, the acidity or base, base, basicness, I guess, a basicity of an aqueous solution is going to be described using the pH scale. All right, this is where we're going to introduce this pH scale. The pH is going to be defined, all right, the pH is going to be defined as the negative log of our hydronium concentration. All right, pH of a neutral solution at 25 degrees Celsius, all right, is then, if we're trying to figure out the pH of this neutral 25 degrees Celsius solution, it's just going to be the negative log of our hydronium concentration, which we just determined was 1 times 10 to the minus 7. All right, and if you plug that into a calculator, what you're going to get is 7. All right, what does that mean? All right, what that means is in a neutral solution at 25 degrees Celsius, 
the pH of that solution is going to be 7. All right. In order for a solution to be acidic, then using this reference, all right, the 7, the pH of a solution, uh, of a neutral solution is 7. All right. In order for a solution then to be acidic, the concentration of the hydronium ions has to be greater than that of the hydroxide ions. What that means is in an acidic solution, the concentration of hydronium has to be greater than 1 times 10 to the minus 7. All right. That, and when you do the negative log of something that's greater than 10 to the minus 7, then the pH is going to be less than 7. And so now what we have is a pH scale. All right. We're going to think of it as 1 to 14. All right, where 7 is neutral, pH at 7 is neutral. Likewise, pOH, the P pOH of the hydroxide, which is defined similarly, pOH is going to be the negative log of your hydroxide here. For a neutral solution, if you plug in, we said that our hydronium is 10, 1 times 10 to the minus 7. Our hydroxide in a neutral solution is also equal to that because it's a neutral solution. And if you do the negative log of the hydroxide, 1 times 10 to the minus 7, you're also going to get 7. So the pH in a neutral solution is 7. The pOH in a neutral solution is also 7. Now, if you want an acidic, if you want an acidic solution, if you want your solution to be acidic, all right, then the pH has to be, the pH is going to be less than 7. All right, so less than 7 is acidic. What that means is that your hydronium concentration has to be greater for a acidic solution. And when your hydronium concentration is greater than seven, uh, greater than one times 10 to the minus seven, and then you perform the minus log of that to get the pH, what you're gonna get for your value for pH is anything between one up to the point of seven, all right? And so your acidic solution is defined as having a hydronium concentration that's greater than 10 to the minus 7. All right. In a basic solution, your hydronium concentration is going to be much less than that. All right. But in a neutral solution, it will be equal to 10 to the minus 7. In a neutral solution, also remember your hydroxide solution is also going to be 10 to the minus 7 and have a pH of 7. All right. In a in in a acidic concentration, in an acidic solution, your hydroxide concentration is going to be less than 10 to the minus 7. But for a basic concentration, uh, for a basic solution, your hydroxide concentration is going to be greater than 10 to the minus 7. All right, so now you have the scale where 7 is neutral, is a neutral solution. All right, 1 up to that point is acidic. Any pH greater than 7 all right, any pH greater than 7 is going to be basic. All right, we're defining it in terms of pH. All right, fantastic. All right, so keep this in mind. Let's do an example problem. All right, let's do an example problem. Actually, um, one more thing before we do an example problem. All right. For a solution, you can calculate the pH. All right, for a solution, you can calculate the, the pH of the solution. All right. You can also calculate the pOH of the solution. The pH plus the pOH. What is that going to give you? That's going to give you back your pKW value. All right, that equilibrium uh, constant for the auto ionization of water. All right, that we define as KW, pH plus pOH is going to give you back pKW. All right, the negative log of your KW value. Fantastic. Now what we want to do is actually jump into a practice problem. This problem says the hydronium ion concentration of a particular aqueous solution is 3.7 times 10 to the minus 4 at 25 degrees Celsius. Determine the pH, the hydroxide solution uh, concentration, and the pOH of, of this solution. All right. Now, it's important to know that all these values, all these quantities, they're interconnected. If you know any one of these for a given solution, you can easily determine the others for the solution. 
All right. So if we already know, all right, the concentration of the hydronium ions, H3O+, then we can easily determine the pH directly, right? And in this problem, we're given the hydronium concentration. It's 3.7 times 10 to the minus 4. So what we can do right away, easily, is calculate the pH. Why? Because the pH is just the negative value, negative log value of your hydronium concentration. So let's go ahead and plug in those values. pH is going to equal the negative log of 3 3.7, sorry, 3.7 times 10 to the minus 4. All right, and if you plug that into a calculator, what we're going to get is 3.43. The pH is 3.43. All right, now, when you take the log, it... Um, you will have the same number of decimal places as the number of significant figures in the original value. So in this case, the concentration has two significant figures. All right. We're going to uh, make sure that there's also two significant figures in the pH. Now, once you know the pH, you can determine the pOH. All right. How can you do this? Well, pH all right, pH plus pOH is going to equal your pKW. What is your pKW? That's just equal to 14. All right, so now using this equality, all right, I, I never defined it here. That's my bad. All right, pH plus pOH is going to equal to your pKW, your negative log of your kW value. This is going to equal 14, by the way. All right. Because if you remember in our definition of Kw, it's going to be your concentration of hydronium times your concentration of hydroxide. That's going to equal 1 times 10 to the minus 14. If you take the negative log of that, all right, what you're going to get is your pKw. And that is going to equal to 14. So we're going to use this relationship, all right, now that we know what the pH is and we know what pKw is to figure out pOH. POH is simply 14 minus your pH. So what that means is 14 minus 3.43, that's going to equal 10.57. All right. The KW equation tells us the product of our hydronium and hydroxide. It's 1 times 10 to the minus 14. All right. PKW is 14, and we just use this relationship to figure out the pOH. So now we have the pH, we have the pOH. What we're going to do as a last part of this problem that it's asking is we need to figure out the OH, the hydroxide uh, concentration. All right, well, we're going to go back to the basics. We know our KW is going to be our hydronium times our hydroxide concentrations. This is all going to equal 1 times 10 to the minus 14, right? Well, what we know now, all right, what we know is our KW and we know our hydronium concentration. So we're going to use that to figure out our hydroxide concentration. Our hydroxide concentration is then going to be 1 times 10 to the minus 14. We've divided, divided both sides by the hydronium concentration. All right. And now what we can do is just calculate this because we know what our hydronium concentration is. It's 3.7 times 10 to the minus 4. Plug this into the calculator, and what we get is 2.7 times 10 to the minus 11. This is our hydroxide concentration. So now we figured the pH, the pOH, and the hydroxide concentration for this problem. All right. That's all I have for you for now for this chapter. In the next part, we're going to talk about strong acids and bases as well as weak acids and bases. I hope this was helpful. Stay tuned for the next part and let me know if you have any questions down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful day.